Hello and welcome to Box the Talk. I'm Shekhar Gupta in Chennai at my friends Mariam and N Ram's wonderful home. Of course, accompanied by these brilliant birds who can talk a little bit in Tamil, but unfortunately, they are not my guests today. My guest, somebody who knows who can little, talk in Tamil, who, who, who can talk in Tamil, <laughs> and who cannot talk to birds, but you can talk to genes, human genes and DNA. Indeed, Professor Eric Lander. Welcome great, to Walk the Talk. Great to be here. Very, and, very good. Uh, you've been called rock star of biotech, of, 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 of genetic sciences, of uh, biology. I guess I've been called that, but I don't know. And you've been called bad things also? <laughs> <laughs> it's just an amazing time in genetics. Yeah. And so. Look, genetics is something that nobody knew anything about. Uh, someone like me who studied biology in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I do remember my F1, F2 and uh, Mendel's law and uh -huh. stuff like that. And we all, all our imaginations uh, were fired when Dr. Hargobind Khurana got his Nobel Prize because he had an Indian name, not an Indian citizen, but Indian extraction. Uh, but since then, the complete change and the revolution you and your team brought about about 12 years ago? Well, look, then you map the genome. Uh, this is a wonderful international project. Scientists right. came together and said, right. you know, all this information is written in all of our cells. Right. And in the 1950s, when Watson and Crick figured out the double helical structure Absolutely. of DNA, yes. they had no clue that in their lifetime it would ever be possible to read out all that information. And then starting in the you know, mid-1980s, people said, maybe, maybe it might just be possible to read out all three billion letters of, of human inheritance. And remarkably, the scientific community came together across nations and got the thing done in a little more than 10 years. And said, if these birds can learn to speak Tamil, oh, we, 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 to we can learn DNA. to read <laughs> DNA. Exactly. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yes. And uh, so uh, you just had this mass, a tiny mass called DNA, and you just broke it up? Well, the, look, if, if, it was, if it was sensible, you'd start at the beginning of the book and right. you'd just start reading from one end to the other. But we can't read DNA like that. So it, it, it was a question of turning it into a, a vast jigsaw puzzle. Take all the DNA out of the cells in your body, shred it up into tiny little pieces, a few hundred letters each, a few hundred chemical units each, and then by painstaking chemical methods, read out those letters and then by computer patch them all back together in this jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And it was a great impetus to invent lots of new methods in the laboratory and in the computer. And you know, around 2001, 2002, 2003, we found we were done. Except we weren't really done, of course, because all we had was three billion letters. It was as if, uh, as if I got a book in Tamil. Mm. I couldn't read it. There'd be a lot of letters, I could see all the letters, but I wouldn't know what it meant. So much more interesting than this human genome project over, the, over that previous decade has been the last 10 years when we've been trying to learn how to read the language of DNA. So cracking the code in a way. Well, right. So when people yeah. talk about the Human Genome Project, they often say that was cracking the genetic code. Right. Well, not really. It was just reading out the letters. Right. Right. Cracking the code is cracking the meaning. That, that that's what's going on in, in, yeah. in this past decade. And that's made progress. Well, look, that makes progress we really care about. It makes progress for medicine. Because look, the embarrassing thing about the 20th century was we could describe diseases but we couldn't tell you what the cause was. We could tell you lots about, oh, diabetes and heart disease and, and mental disease, and we could give descriptions, but if you ask me, why do some people get and diabetes? Autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease. Complex. You know, why does this happen? Well, nobody could really give a good reason why one person might die early of a heart attack and another wouldn't. Uh, one person might have a mental disease like schizophrenia and another person wouldn't, let alone a good accounting of the the, like the cellular machinery by which it works and by which one might hope to fix it. So it's just one great big black box. And the great thing about DNA was it was a uniform way to pry open the black box so of We were disease. all treating symptoms. We're treating Effectively. symptoms. Well, because right. that's all you could do. And right. in any given generation, you do what you can. Right. So right. without knowing causes, you treat symptoms. Right. So, you know, we're still, of course, babies at reading this language. But it's been possible to now work out 108 genes that play a role in schizophrenia, or 60 genes that are correlated with why some people get early heart attacks. 
uh, for many rare genetic diseases, there's now been at least 3,600 that have been solved. So, you know, we're all proud as a scientific community to be able to put this information out there. But even then, like with the Human Genome Project, with these catalogs today, we know this is just one next step on the road to understanding now how do all those pieces work together and how are we going to treat them? And so it's really a progression that, that has always in mind our children. This is really for the next generation that right. we want to have all this laid out. And grandchildren. And grandchildren. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, you know, if you, if you think about, oh, you know, Wall Street and biotechnology, you know, they're, they're focused very appropriately on the next quarter and the next year. And I'm glad they, they worry about those timelines. But if you're doing science, the timelines that matter are what is this generation going to do for right. the next generation. Right. And I think we all feel a responsibility to hand over to the next generation a clear understanding so of the basics. It's an of example disease. that you've used, so I'm sort of stealing, uh, stealing from you. Yeah. Uh, that people who found out that bacteria caused infections yes. didn't quite know the answer to bacteria then. Right. 1870. Right. And then that led to... It took 75 years 75 before years. you get to penicillin. Yes. But when you get to penicillin, for all time forward, you right. know how to make antibiotics. Right. And so the great thing about scientific knowledge is when you get it, it's forever. So when we understand what the basis of cancers are and the different ways in which cells can keep growing without end, well, there's a finite number of tricks that cancers have. We're going to get that whole list of tricks. And as it already is happening, people will develop drugs against this trick and that trick that the probability... Because, because we are in, so in a way bidding against HIV now because it's now... It, if you get proper treatment, it's a chronic disease. It's chronic disease. No, no. It's, it's a manageable chronic disease. Well, it's not cured. It's a manageable no, chronic right. disease. And for, for practical purposes, that's a win. We're not winning against most cancer right now because right. even when we have a drug, it's just one of them and it becomes resistant. But with the tools of, of genomics... It's what we, you call a cell poison. Well, most of the drugs are just poisons. You, you try to kill cells generally and hope that the cancer cells are more sensitive. But the, the recent generation of cancer drugs are not cell poisons. They go after one specific protein out of the tens of thousands of proteins in the cell. And they just get that one. And that's like, to, pick, to switch metaphors, it's, it's like the Achilles heel. You look for the Achilles heel of that cancer cell. And if I hit that yeah. cancer cell there, right. it dies, and the other cells don't. That's the kind of thing that is, is the goal of cancer right now, of cancer researchers, and we're seeing it happen more and more. And of course, it's frustrating for someone who has cancer because we're not all the way there. The best drugs will often extend life by a, a year or two. And you'll say, oh, that's not very much. And I've lost good friends to cancer and I'm frustrated by it. But as you look at it across the sweep of time, you say, well, this is pretty impressive. We had people who had metastatic skin cancer and they had no hope. And now there are drugs that make that disappear completely, although it comes back in a year or so. But to a scientist that says, hmm, one trick down. We gotta get two more tricks and then we, we win. So genomics is converted. This is what I mean about opening it up and looking inside the black box. Before you could just try drugs and try poisons and hope. Or under the hood of the car as. Well, as, as I've like said, use, yes. right. It's, it'd be like if you had to fix your car without being able to pop the hood. Right. Sometimes you could get it right by just guessing, but it's no, it's no strategy in, for fixing uh, your India, car. In India, particularly in South India, we have a tradition of Nadi Vaidyas. These are very wise doctors who feel your pulse and tell you. Right. So, I mean, maybe they can get it right sometimes, right. but it's not as much information Absolutely. as you would really like Absolutely. to have. So, to me, the single most important thing is making sure that we have all of that information about every disease. And if my generation leaves to the next generation the catalog of causes of disease and mechanisms of disease, I'm pretty confident that the next generation is going to be able to use that to truly drive all sorts of powerful therapies. So, tell me, how does Mr. Professor Eric Lander, director of the Broad Institute uh, with MIT and Harvard, on the president's co-chair of the president's advisory council on science and technology. Uh, as I said, rock star is actually a, uh, a shortcut, but you know, wonderful. I don't scientist. actually sing very well, but right. anyway, yeah, right. <laughs> wonderful scientist. Scientist. Uh, why do you and how do you find time to teach freshman biology class? Oh goodness! Well, look. 
I mean, isn't your time better employed in the lab with something? On pouring over a petri dish, I'm, I'm using it metaphorically. So, no. The answer is no for two reasons. One, look, everything I was telling you about the responsibility of the next generation to carry on, well, it's a very important responsibility of our generation to inspire that next generation. The work is not finished with any one generation. Right. And if we don't take up the responsibility of teaching and inspiring, there aren't going to be those people. That's the, the high-minded reason. There's also a selfish reason, I've got to say. Every time in September that I go back into a freshman classroom and I begin to spin the story of biology and of DNA, I see the light bulbs go on and I see the, the light shine in the eyes of freshmen and they say, wow, this is amazing. And when I tell them about these amazing stories, it reminds me how amazing this field is. So I get energy and sustenance out of telling this story to young, unjaded students.